global version morning report it's so funny whenever i i'm so like wary now of speaking because i know that the second we hit record button that weird voice pops out i think it's good practice to try to talk over it even though you shouldn't talk over anybody in real life but um i'm amazed that doesn't make it into the recording which it doesn't right that's not in the actual recording that this meeting is being recorded great amazing dream team we have a smaller group today and i absolutely love that you know um I'll tell you, I thrive in smaller groups. I'm much happier. I am a pseudo extrovert, which now that all of you know medicine, you know what that means. That means that I am uh, an introvert that can masquerade as an extrovert. I am not in fact an extrovert. And I love it when there's a small crowd of people. And I also love to know the people uh, a little bit more, the people that I have the privilege of hanging out with. So we're going to do one case. And if you have a case, please, please, please type in the chat and volunteer to present it. But more important than doing the case is actually getting to know each other since it's a smaller group. So maybe, um, uh, maybe I'll just start with the folks who have their video on if they wouldn't mind just unmuting and saying hello, I'll, I'll kind of, kind of prompt people. And then uh, for those of you who don't have your video on, if it's okay, I'm just going to go down the screen and just unmute yourself and say hi to the people around you. Um, and tell us a little bit about yourself. And we'll, it's so nice to just be able to have a few minutes to get to know each other. So um, in no particular order, just based on video, Kanu, do you want to unmute and say hi? Hello, everyone. Uh, it's been a long time since I've been absent from CP Solvers. Good to be back. It's probably my last free weekend before the intern year starts. So I'm really excited. That's incredible. Thank you again for joining us. We've missed you. Tell, tell folks where you're from and where you're going to do your intern year. Yeah, uh, so I'm from India, uh, and I'll be doing my intern here at um, St. Vincent Hospital in Worcester, which is with the uh, University of Massachusetts. Oh, and where are you right now? Uh, I'm in Worcester in Massachusetts right oh, now. Okay. Just moved last week. Amazing. Uh, well, welcome. If you ever uh, need to take a break and come out west, you have a home in California, that's for sure. Hans, good morning. Do you want to say hi? Take your time. Oh, we can't hear you quite yet, huh? Now it works, sorry. That's okay. I, I think you can hear me now. Yes. Hello, good morning. I'm still visiting my mom and I'm hoping that I can return at least for step three. I'm still <laughs> at Ross University. Wonderful. Hans, how do you say good morning in German? Guten Morgen. Guten Morgen. Beautiful language, I swear. And Kanu, how do you say it in Hindi? Mira naam Kanu hai. Mira naam Kanu hai. Wonderful. Ravi, hello. That's an amazing bookshelf you have behind you. Do you want to introduce yourself to folks? Yeah, I'm Ravi. Uh, that's a virtual background. I have somebody working <laughs> yeah. behind, uh, behind me. Uh, so um, I'm Ravi. I'm in Baltimore. I'm at Sina Hospital. Uh, just taking an hour to decompress. It's been a busy morning. Uh, I'm running the ICU step down this morning, so I uh, had a great time last week listening to the case and the phenomenal case that uh, Kirtan presented yesterday, um, so hoping to hear something uh, as lively today. Absolutely. Hey, thank you so much for joining us. Natalia, hello. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm good too. So I am Natalia, I am from Brazil, and I am a medical student. Wonderful. Where in Brazil are you? Uh, are you from? I am from Minas Gerais. Minas Gerais. Where is that? Is that in what part of the country? Well, it's I. I don't know how to explain to you. <laughs> it's like in the southern east okay, in Brazil. What is your favorite favorite local delicacy, like food that? If I were oh. like to visit you, what would you recommend? Uh, pão de queijo. It's okay. like it's like a bread made of cheese. I actually I will make this today with my grandma. So Amazing. it's wonderful. Hey, can you email us a picture? Oh yeah, I can. <laughs> yeah, I want to see it. Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Sherry, good morning. Are you in a place where you can unmute yourself? Hello. Good morning, everyone. Zhao an, which means good morning in Chinese Mandarin. Say that again. Zhao an. 
Go on. I'm currently in San Francisco, but I'm originally from Taiwan. I'll be starting residency in two days. Yes. Excited. Amazing. Sherry and I will be at the same program. Where are you? What rotation are you starting on, Sherry? I'll be starting on night flow at the General Hospital. Yeah. Can I tell you something? That's exactly where I started. That was my first ever rotation at night flow at the General. That's amazing. It's terrifying, but a lot of fun. And if you need anything, you know how to find me. Yes, looking forward to it. Thank you. Of course. Drew, what's up? Hi, friends. Um, currently uh, in the passenger seat and driving on the way to Michigan, where I start orientation uh, Monday. Uh, but um, found the time to join you guys and hopefully listen to a good case. Delighted to have you here, my friend. Hey, Drew, I never asked you this. Do you speak any other languages? Um, currently in the process of learning Espanol, Portu uh, Portuguese, uh, had a passing knowledge of Mandarin in my college days that I slowly lost and is starting to come back, uh, or needs to come back. And, um, I guess, uh, a smattering of a smattering of Tamil and Hindi to round it out and only enough to get me in trouble basically. That's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. I feel like that's how most people start to learn languages is how to get into trouble first and then they can talk themselves out of trouble. Wonderful. <laughs> nice to see you again, Drew. Roberto, are you able to unmute yourself? I give uh, Roberto uh, a few seconds here. All right, I don't think so, but if I'm wrong, please do. Erica, do you want to say hi? All right, moving on to Isadora. Do you want to say hi, Isadora? I think people who turn their video on are like sending me a message slowly, but, but surely no. What about Luana? Luana, do you want to say good morning? Hi, good morning. Hello. My name is Juan, I'm from Brazil. I'm a second year uh, medical student. I'm also from Minas Gerais. Oh, really? Yeah. Wait, do you know each other? Well, oh, actually, no. Why you do? <laughs> yeah, that's it, like my second meeting with you guys, okay. but I'm loving it. Wonderful, welcome. It's a delight to have you here. And now you know somebody else in Minas Gerais. Wonderful. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Of course. Uh, where am I? Paola, are you here? Hi, hello. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> it's so nice to uh, finally talk. I've always been a spectator. A spectator, sorry. <laughs> yes. It's nice to hear your voice. Tell us about yourself. Uh, well, I'm from Lima, from Peru. Wonderful. I'm a sixth year medical student uh, from out of seven years. We. Yeah, so next time next year is my uh, intern year. Mm -hmm. And I actually love listening to you guys every time I get a chance to join. Uh, it's really helpful. It's really, uh, I don't know, it's it's really, <laughs> it's just really happy and motivating to listen to you every time discussing. So thank you for that. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. It's a delight. You know, I, um, we all get our energy from each other, I think. And I, and I think hearing your voice today and hearing you say that is, is really fuel. And I, I honestly will be very transparent with you. I hope I hope we can discuss a case together. I think it's all about um, taking all of us who want to be nervous about um, participating publicly in medicine and be more and more comfortable doing that. So thank you for um, saying hi and uh, and uh, being a part of the family, um, even if you're sitting in the back. That's uh, uh, I will tell you that most of the times I'm sitting in the back, and as I said earlier, the pseudo extrovert in me is. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I know that. Uh, I promise I will uh, join to this cause one day. Yeah, I promise. <laughs> take, 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 you should go at your own pace, take all the time you need. But in the meantime, what's one fun fact about Lima, Peru that you want to share with us? A fun fact? Yeah. Um, food, <laughs> definitely. <Yes, always. laughs> food is awesome here. And yeah. well, it's one of the things I'm very proud of being a Peruvian. And also the beautiful places, touristic places that uh, there are to visit here. 
you those know, two. I'm very proud of those two, to be honest. It really should be. I, I tell you, I've always dreamt of going to Peru, partly because um, I, what I heard, but all my sister went there and she just had the most magical time. So I, uh, I really hope that I can take these fun facts and actually live through them. I see that uh, Isadora had, has uh, turned her video on. You want to say hi? Hi. <laughs> My name is Isadora. I'm a fourth year medical student from Brazil. I've been watching VMR live for a month, but I've never talk, talked here because I'm still learning English, so I don't feel very comfortable. But I really love to uh, listen to the discussion, and I hope that someday I can, yeah. I can help you guys. <laughs> 100%. Rafa, what do you think? How, did, how does she do with her English? Oh my God, much better than mine. <laughs> no, Rafa, Ralph, you're too kind. <laughs> Rafa's English is wonderful, but I think you haven't beat. <laughs> I'm just poking at Rafa. Because, you know, he always pokes at me. I don't know if you noticed, Rafa always pokes at me every single time. Anyway, thank you so much for joining us. And honestly, my unbiased opinion is your English is much better than you think it is. Trust me. The lion, do you want to say hi? Hello. Hello, everyone. I'm the lion. I'm a final year student from New Delhi, India. And um, it's lovely being here. I look forward to this time slot. It's actually 9.30 in, uh, at night here. So from 9.30 to 10.30, approximately, it's the most enjoyable time of the day. Oh, that's very delightful for you to say. It's so nice to see you again, my friend. And um, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still reflecting and uh, processing the uh, Boris discussion. You were so marvelous in your reflection with that case. And I think um, I'm, there's still a lot to digest in that, but I learned a lot from being in the lukewarm seat with you. Can I ask you, what's, um, what is um, breakfast like in New Delhi? I'm really curious. Oh, uh, it depends. Uh, yeah. So I think the most common breakfast would be uh, something called chole and bhature. So chole is basically a uh, white chickpeas. Uh, so uh, white chickpeas, how do I explain? Okay, maybe uh, you know hummus. Yes. So it's the thing they ground to make hummus. Right, 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 right. So they make a gravy out of it, and bhature would be something like a fried bread. Yeah. Uh, roti. I guess you're familiar with roti. So something like a fried uh, roti, and it's delicious. Oh, that sounds absolutely amazing. You know, honestly, I not only does it sound absolutely amazing, I actually know that it is absolutely amazing because I've had it before, but I'm glad oh, that you shared it with people. Amazing. All right, y'all. Um, I'm going to make a request. Um, I'm going to um, publicly ask you if you all have a case. So if you have a case to present, please volunteer. And then if anyone else is willing to um, say hello uh, before we go to our last video presenter, which is Gabrielle, please just turn your video on for a second just to signal if you're willing to say hello. Uh, if not, I won't bother you. Um, it looks like we have Gabriella and then Gurleen. And if anybody else wants to jump in and say hi, please turn your video on briefly or say so in the chat. Um, Gabriella, do you want to say hi? Hi, guys. Um, hello, my name is Gabriel. I'm from Lima, Peru. Maria was asking me about my favorite food from Peru. We are known for having a lot of cuisine. And this was a hard question because I love all the Peruvian food. But my favorite is Seco de Chabelo that is made of from um, a fried maduro that is like a banana with dry meat and it's very delicious. I love also ceviche that oh is with fish. I think we should just all, we should all just hang out one day with the food that we talked about. <laughs> just put the case aside and just bring the food outside. Amazing, thank you, Gabriela. Yeah. Last but not least, Gurleen, do you wanna say hi? Hi everyone, I'm Gurleen. Um, I'm getting really hungry thinking about all the food we're talking about, but I'll be um, starting intern year at Brigham on Monday on cardiology Ooh. night float. So oh I'm excited God. and nervous. Yeah, I think it's so telling that you're starting on cardiology, my friend. It couldn't be better. <laughs> I, I, that's a really nice sofa that you have. Is that new for the move? Yeah, I just like brought some furniture home back from home because I had some extra. So I, I like brought some stuff from Albany back to Boston and to New Jersey and then New Jersey up to Boston. So. Awesome. Gurleen, there's, there's your con clinical excellence is memorable in many ways, but, but mostly because of its consistency, just like how amazingly like consistent you are in doing everything. And, um, and I got so used to your consistent background, you know, like same <laughs> position, everything. And now I'm going to have to get used to this new background. It's going to take me a little while. 
but it's yeah. delight, delighted to see you here and um, hopefully intern year will be a blast. It will be a lot of hardship, no doubt, but um, hopefully a lot of learning too. Thank you. Amazing. Well, it's so nice to hear everyone's voices. And again, if you if you turn your video on, I will find you and ask you to introduce yourself, but I totally respect the idea of wanting to learn to hang back. Um, we have 40 minutes to talk of medicine. Who, does anyone have a case? Or do y'all want to just talk about food for 40 minutes? Drew wants a case, y'all. Are you really going to get... Oh. All right, Rafael, let's do it. Let's do it. So, um, you know, folks, we'll do this the usual style. Um, we'll do one case, and then we'll... I encourage you all um, to participate in the chat, share your thinking, um, and um, we'll put all our minds together to nerd out. Oh, can I tell you something? I should tell you something. Oh, oh no, I can't tell you publicly a recording. It's really sad. Let me, I'm going to type it in the chat, but don't say it out loud. Okay. Uh, uh, this is like the awkward silence. Yeah, it's kind of sad. Yeah, I think it's somebody from uh, somebody for it seems like somebody from YouTube who was not very nice. But it's okay. We recovered it. Most of it, not all of it. But a lot of it is still missing. So I won't. Uh, yeah, I don't want to tempt them. Okay, but we'll make do. We will make do. Though I really I got really sad for one day, but that's okay. All right, y'all. Rafa, let's jump in. Okay, so this is a 39-year-old man with a chief complaint of chest pain. Chest pain. By the way, thank you all for your incredibly kind comments in the chat. Oh, I'm so touched. Yeah. Hey, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's do this. 39-year-old man with chest pain. All right, you want to tell us a little bit more? What do you think? Or stop here? Yeah, this is an excellent stop. I place just. Oh, okay. All right. All right, y'all. I'm going to, I'm going to, we'll do this the usual style. I'm going to mute myself for 30 seconds. Keep going. How do you think about chest pain? What is the, what is the, uh, what is the fact that this is a 39 year old with chest pain do for you? And we'll put our thoughts together. All right, a lot of a lot of great thoughts. Fernand, tell us what you're thinking. Yeah, hi. Uh, how are you? Um, well, I mean, anything is possible. He's in that um, age range where he's still young, but he's also in that area where you can have early ischemic heart disease, early valvular disease. Um, we have to think of uh, all the structures in the heart, in the lung, in the chest wall, the musculoskeletal system. And sometimes it could be referred to the chest from somewhere else. Um, there are also deeper structures like the vessels such as the aorta that we could think of. We have to make sure we rule out urgent problems such as um, coronary artery disease, aortic dissection, PE. And uh, did I miss anything? I think I, I missed one. <laughs> that was awesome. That was absolutely comprehensive. And folks in the chat are um, uh, supplementing your uh, ter terrific start. Fatima, do you want to just tell us more what you're thinking? I think Fatima can unmute. It's okay. Um, <laughs> it looks like Connor. Oh, Sorry, oh, hi, there you are, there you are, there you are. So, yeah, tell us more. Uh, yeah, so like anything to do with the heart, with the lungs and with the GI. But first of all, we are going to rule out uh, things that can be an emergency, life threatening immediately. Uh, for example, a pulmonary embolism, ischemic heart disease, and, you know, like, and the more common thing. 
for example, it could be uh, simple girls going on. <clears throat> yeah. I think that's beautiful. You know, it could... like pancreatitis, like if we go for the, you know, like the epigastric pain. I think you're teaching us a lot there. First is to be mindful that, that common things are common, but life-threatening things also exist in the chest. And yeah, he could have GERD, um, but you have to think about the more um, sinister stuff first. Um, and I also love that you reminded us that upper, you know, we talk about um, chest pathologies presenting as abdominal pains, for example, an inferior myocardial infarction presenting abdominal pain, but it's not unheard of that upper abdominal pathologies present as chest pain. So I think it's totally appropriate to think about pancreatitis in a case where you don't have a good handle on the cause of the chest pain. I think that's absolutely suggestive. Now, Lion, do you want to tell us more about the four plus two plus two? Oh, yes, absolutely. It's something I learned from here only. And four plus two plus two is basically to rule out all the emergent causes of chest pain, uh, so basically in a setting of emergency. And when we think of chest pain, we uh, cannot afford to just uh, localize to just heart because we have lots of structures in the thoracic cavity. So uh, A, heart, B, lungs, and C, esophagus. So let's start with esophagus. We have esophagus impaction and perforation. Uh, so two very uh, interesting causes to rule out here. Of course, a history of alcoholism would help. Uh, for uh, the two pulmonary related causes, we have something called uh, new, uh, pulmonary embolism. And uh, maybe uh, uh, pleuritis. Uh, pleuritis has a more focal onset pain. Or we can have something like uh, pneumothorax or hemothorax. But the four cardiac causes are uh, the one we have to focus the most because the mortality uh, is the highest. So I don't think I can recall all of them, but maybe something uh, something like ACS, that is acute coronary syndrome, uh, Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. Um, and then uh, maybe you can fill me up on two others. I remember there's two A and two T's. Yes. So, ACS, aortic dissection. Tempanad and Takatsuba. You nailed it. Yeah, um, you know, it's funny, like, um, oh, one, why, 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 why. he's a very barky dog. One sec. <laughs> he saw something, so we'll see. <laughs> that was beautiful. Thank you so much. That was absolutely wonderful. And yes, um, the, the, the T of tamponade and the T of Takatsubo are harder to remember than the A's, and that's probably because they're less important. It really is mostly about the ACS and the aortic dissection. And Natalia, you were, oh, Natalia, you were telling us earlier, sorry, sorry, sorry. Natalia, you were telling us about the, about the pain itself. Tell us more. Well, I will try to say it in English, but it's hard. But anyway, we have to ask this patient to Tell us where exactly is the pain, if it, and we can ask him to point the the localization, I don't know, the spot where is is hurting, and we have to ask him that if how much pain does this patient is feeling, and how is that pain? It's like in I don't know half a minute. <laughs> se ela tá em aperto, se tá enfacada, é, if it's, se tá... If the, she wants to know if the pain is squeezing, pressure like. Yeah, thank you. And we we have to know if the pain is, I don't know, walking to another place. I don't know. In Brazil, we call it irradiação. I don't know how to say it in English. It is the same, radiating to another region. Yeah. The pain's radiating. Beautiful. I yeah, I, I agree with the all, all the things that you said before. And I think it, that's it. I don't know what, what else to talk about. <laughs> Can I tell you two things? One, it's amazing. I, I can't tell you how incredible it is to watch somebody who is um, learning another language and becoming more facile yeah. in another language, but comfortable to try. And I think in life, it's amazing how much fear we have in trying new things that seem scary. And um, even though I'm very comfortable speaking in English, watching you try gives me encouragement to take the risks that I need to take in the parts of my life that I'm not sure about. You know, everyone has something that they're like, should I do it? Should I not do it? And it's really inspiring to see you like, push yourself. And um, here you'll get nothing but love for that. Um, 
But number two is uh, is you're one hundred percent correct. And I think the last thing you were saying is exertion. So when somebody's pain worsens with movement or walking, that's very scary, right? Because that tells you that there's something about exertion, which tells you that it's probably something with the heart. So I love that point. Um, there's so many incredible thoughts coming in the chat. Um, and I think that um, as it, I'd be remiss to not highlight all of them, but one that I think brings out the two dimensions of this, because Natalia is talking about talking to the patient and I think Sherry said something that's actually very practical about like what you need to do in the moment. So Sherry, do you want to just tell us about your, your how you'd be thinking about the CT scan that you mentioned? Yes, happy to. So I remember Robbie was sharing his pearl. He works at the ED a lot. So when triaging patients, your first instinct is to feel whether this patient has more worrisome symptoms that might indicate a life-threatening conditions and the condition that we just talked about the four plus two plus two. And usually the CT scan can like rule out most of them just by doing a chest CT. So the heart problems and GI and the lung problems mm -hmm. can be ruled out. And once you've done the CT scan and it can give you a pretty confidence answer whether it can be a life-threatening condition or not. That's superb, my friend. That's superb. And that's, I think that's the point that you and Natalia are making in synergy. And as Natalia said, when you talk to a patient, you have to ask really important questions. And in your conversation with more and more experience, you'll develop a sense of, oh, is this a life-threatening cause with just the history and physical? The history and physical will, will not tell you aortic dissection versus PE versus ACS, but you'll be more comfortable teasing out life-threatening from non-life-threatening by just talking to the patient. For example, if I now tell you, hey, I'm 31 years old, I have no medical problems, and I have a little bit of like a little bit of discomfort in my chest, but it comes and goes, and I can run four miles, five miles, no problem. That conversation, non-life-threatening cause. But if I tell you, hey, while I was running, I had the sudden onset of severe chest pain and I could no longer walk. Serious chest pain, right? So no matter, so you talk to the patient and you develop a sense of, is this high risk or low risk chest pain? No matter what, everybody needs an EKG, a troponin and a chest x-ray. That's basic um, evaluation to make sure that some things that um, are easily missed are not missed. And I think that's where Sherry's point comes in. If you are in a world where you talk to a patient and you are worried and you get an EKG and a troponin, which you have to in everybody, and they are not diagnostic of acute coronary syndrome, you have to get a CT. Why? Because a CT chest will show everything else that is scary. Pulmonary embolism, aortic dissection, tamponade with a big pericardial effusion, pneumothorax, esophageal rupture, esophageal impaction. Everything shows up on a CT chest, everything. So what's a common mistake I've seen? High risk chest pain by conversation with the patient. EKG troponin non-diagnostic. Let's wait and get a repeat EKG troponin. Again, non-diagnostic. Let's wait again and get another EKG and troponin. Again, non-diagnostic. So if you work on the front lines and you see somebody with scary chest pain that does not have an answer on EKG troponin, get a CT chest right away. It's that simple. And I can't tell you the number of pulmonary embolisms I've seen delayed, diagnosed, two or three aortic dissection where we waited 30 minutes, an hour, 30 minutes, an hour just to hope the EKG gives us the answer, but can't. So um, get EKGs over time for sure, but don't forget that there are other life-threatening causes. And I think um, I'm right here with all of you. I'm really curious what this poor 39 year old, I hope it's not something serious, but we certainly won't miss it if we get an EKG troponin and if there's no answer, get a CT right away. All right, Rafa, back to you, my friend. Yeah, this is why I told you that it was an excellent place to stop. <laughs> Such a rich discussion. So um, this patient, when it comes to the pain, they said that it's one self-limited episode that occurred two days ago. He described it, it as substernal pressure-like and squeezing. When it comes to the tempo of the pain, he said that it actually started suddenly while exercising at the gym and increased within seconds to peak intensity nine out of 10. 
uh, then gradually subside over the next hour. Um, if there is any association with the position, the, the patient says that it's worsened with recumbency and improved by sitting up. Uh, when it comes to uh, prior condition, this patient has hypertension and is using hydrochlorothiazide. Hydrochlorothiazide, sorry. And I, I think I'm gonna give the vital signs as well. Temperature is normal. The blood pressure is 153 over 93 and symmetric in both arms. This patient has a high rate of 68 and he's saturating 100% on room air. And I'll give you the physical exam as well, just to help. Uh, general appearance, this patient is young, well-appearing, conversant and pleasant. Jugular venous pressure is not elevated. Um, when it comes to the cardiac exam, it's normal. The lungs are also normal. The abdomen is also normal. When it comes to the extremities, uh, symmetric, strong peripheral pulses in both arms and legs. And that's the end of the other quote. Oof, y'all, there's so much to talk about. And I would say, keep your thoughts flowing but I'll draw your attention to a couple things that I think we should all talk about, which is what do we do when the pain is sudden? What do we do um, with the fact that it's worsened with, um, a uh, with lying back? And what do we do with the exam, which is largely unremarkable? So I'm gonna mute for 30 seconds, keep your thoughts coming, but let's talk about those three things for sure. Sudden, worsened with um, lying back and then a relatively unremarkable exam. All right, let's think together. 30 seconds. Hans, it seems that you were worried about pericarditis pretty quickly. Can you tell us more how you got there? Yep, just as you mentioned before, it's getting better when he's sitting up, maybe leaning forward. And then it's getting worse when he's uh, recumbency laying down. These in the HBI highly indicates a pericarditis, but now we need to find out why does he have any autoimmune disease, any vasculitis, anything that could predispose him for something like this. Beautiful, very well said. Pericarditis is characterized by the two Ps. Positional chest pain, worse when lying back and better when leaning forward. And the other P is pleuritic, also work worse when you take a deep breath in because the lungs hit the pericardium causing it to be irritated. So we have to worry about pericarditis because of the positional nature here. Um, Maria, you were talking about the episodic nature. Can you tell us more about what your mind, what you were thinking? Yes, of course. Whenever I see something that, you know, like for example, in this case that happened once and then it stopped, I always like to go back and really talk with the patient to see like, what was he doing? Did he take something different? Like, was he consuming something other than normal or like doing exercises or anything like even a specific stress? like moment that he had like an argument with somebody and you know usually when it's the patients tend to associate things that might not be the cause of it but then they'll definitely tell you oh like I had like an orange juice that morning and it might not have to like anything to do with it um, but then it's always really important because it might um, and then really taking it, it takes like some time to discuss that with the patient and like really go over everything. But I think like a, a really good past medical history and like a history of the present illness is really important, especially with like triggers and like episodic events. 
beautiful. Uh, that stands by itself, my friend. Beautiful. Um, Gabrielle was teaching us about diagnosing pericarditis. Gabrielle, can you tell us more? Yes, I remember from my pericarditis lecture the, the past year that for making the diagnosis, we need to have the uh, four following criteria. First, a classic thoracic pain that, as you told us, Ravi, is when the, uh, the pain changes with the position. And in the physical exam, you can hear a pericardial friction wrap. Uh, in the EKG, you can see typical ACG changes. And you can also see in the X-ray or in the imaging of the thorax a new or worsening pericardial effusion. And I was talking uh, about a pericardial friction wrap that is present only in one third of the patients. So it's not always present. Beautiful, beautiful, Gabrielle. Thank you for that. Um, Ravi, you were teaching us a little bit about pericarditis, a point that Hans also brought up, but also added, added something about SCAD. Can you teach us about that? Yeah, um, there's an entity called SCAD in young people, something that we should put on the, on the top of our radar screen. Um, it's typically associated with young females, and it can be brought on during uh, childbirth, uh, delivery, uh, exercising, and it's, I think it's also associated with being on oral contraceptives. Uh, but what I didn't know if it was associated with men, since we are dealing with a, a young male here, uh, I did quickly Google to see if there's an association, and it is found apparently in, in young male, um, young men, but uh, I don't know if they're on any medications or not. Then we have, have to also look at connective tissue diseases. I don't know if Marfan syndrome is associated with that, but um, there could be a weakening, I guess, in the connective tissue, which could augment this um, happening. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much for teaching us about that. Okay, um, finally, um, dear friend Anne-Marie, you're worried about dissection, but of another kind, tell us more. Thinking, you know, with pericarditis, it sounds very consistent with this, but in my illness script, I don't usually think of it as an hour event and then suddenly just goes away like that. So that makes me wonder about kind of an initial either tearing event or spasm event. Um, so I'm thinking about either, um, as was mentioned, SCAD or um, vasospasm of the coronary arteries or a dissection event where maybe there was like a small tearing event that's going to precede a larger event. Um, while the symmetric strong pulses um, are present, um, I had said earlier in the JAM article, only like 31% have the unequal pulses or blood pressure. So while it could point towards it if it was present, I guess the lack doesn't dissuade me that much. You know, I gotta say, I'm right there with you. And I think the most concerning thing and the most probably diagnostically helpful thing is the abrupt onset um, of this and the, it developing very quickly tells you that one of three things either happened. Either something tore, like a dissection flap, either something blocked, like a thrombus in the coronaries, or there was a sudden discharge of electrical activity, like a seizure or an arrhythmia. Sudden events are almost always one of those three things. Something broke or tore, bone fracture, pneumothorax bleb, aortic vessel, something blocked, or a sudden discharge of electrical activity. <clears throat> and most of these events are vascular phenomenon. This is what neurologists rely on all the time to make the diagnosis of a cerebral vascular event. Even if you tell a neurologist a very funky distribution, not consistent with the vascular territory, if the patient is able to tell them it, it began abruptly, they're often very worried about a stroke. So here, I'm right there with you. This is very consistent with the vascular phenomenon. Um, the other thing that it could be consistent with is a pneumothorax, but when you put your stethoscope on the lungs, the fact that the lungs are clear here is very helpful. And to be honest, the physical exam in the patient with chest pain is not as helpful as you might think it would be. Most patients with sinister causes of chest pain have an unremarkable and not noteworthy physical exam. ACS, normal exam. Aortic dissection, normal exam. Tamponade, can be picked, can, that's the one thing that you can squeeze out with an exam. Takotsubo, normal exam. PE, normal exam. Esophageal rupture impaction, normal exam. So what is the exam good, great for, for in a patient with chest pain? 
tamponade and pneumothorax. So here we're like, ah, this patient probably doesn't have tamponade, doesn't have pneumothorax, but everything else is fair game. And when you marry that with the sudden onset, you worry, I think, about um, uh, aortic dissection. And then the final connection is how can we bridge these two things? How can we marry Anne Marie's thought of prioritizing aortic dissection with a conversation about pericarditis? Is remember that the ascending aorta can actually irritate the pericardium through direct contact with the pericardium, causing a pericarditis like phenotype. And that actually you can get a hemorrhage into the pericardium from an aortic dissection. So um, we may not have to compete between dissection and, aortic, uh, and pericarditis as um, two separate causes, but rather be able to connect them um, through the intimate relationship that the aorta has um, with the pericardium. But I think this is, uh, the reflections here are magical. Positional pericardium, sudden onset equals rupture, block, or electrical activity. Um, and um, exam, only really good for tamponade and pneumothorax. So we need a lot more information. I think goes, this goes back to Sherry's point. If the EKG and Tavronin are not revealing, this person needs a CT chest stat. One final thing that I'm just realizing now, is this is a 39 year old guy with, a, with hypertension and whether his background hypertension is a clue to the underlying cause. We don't know it's secondary hypertension because he's only on one medication, but it's unusual that he's 39 um, and has hypertension. It may be because of um, early onset of uh, metabolic phenotype. But, you know, you can imagine that somebody has um, renal artery stenosis or fibromuscular dysplasia or autosomal polycystic kidney disease or pheo, all sorts of things. Uh, so I wonder if that's a clue too, but I think we should move on. Because in real life, you'd get EKG troponin and move on. You wouldn't study the hypertension closely. It's not helpful in the moment when somebody is this potentially this sick. All right, Rafa, please back to you. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna give you three pieces of information before the next diagnosis, before the next aliquot, which is actually the diagnosis. So the troponin result was less than uh, 0.05, which is normal. And then I have uh, the ECG and the chest X-ray. It's actually not described, but I can show to you. Mm, this is the chest X-ray. I, I don't know if it will help. Honestly, that looks relatively normal to me. I don't, I'm looking for a wide mediastinum or pneumothorax, um, pulmonary edema. It looks okay to me is my reflex. Uh, okay, exactly. and now I'm gonna show you the ECG. Maybe that will be a little bit harder to see. Yeah, I think the ECG is very hard to see, my friend. Do you wanna just tell uh, us, Joan? It, it, it's not described. I tried to zoom in, maybe it can help. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think so. What is, what's your interpretation of it, my friend? Oh my God. No, please go ahead. <laughs> uh, here you are and telling, here we are giving Natalia a spiel about jumping into your comfort zone and whatnot. And then, and then we're scared of it. Come on. What is it? Do it, do it, do it. Oh, no, no. I'm, I'm presenting. Uh, okay, presenters, I'm presenters don't discuss. <laughs> what's, your best, uh, what's your best guess of this EKG? Yes, that's good. Mm. For me, there is like this ST elevation, probably. Yeah. Mm. And also the KRS complex, they seem very kind of narrow for me. Okay. But so I may be wrong. That's okay. So EKGs are very, very hard. But um, so I'll just ask you a question. Do you see a do you see a P wave? Yeah, I do. Okay, perfect. Um, so no atrial fibrillation. Yeah, wonderful. Do you see any marked ST uh, segment changes? Yeah, I see them. Okay, tell us where they are. Where do you see them? Mm, it's in V1. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I see them very clearly on V1. So uh, in which way is the ST segment, up or down? It's upper. So their ST elevation in V1. And would you say it's sm small or large? Kind of large, almost one square. Almost one square, okay. And is there any other ST elevations anywhere else except V1? No, V2, mm, maybe V3. Okay, yeah, but is it highest in V1? V1 and V2 are the highest. Okay. Mm. Oi, oi. So, okay. Sorry, my EKG uh, knowledge is not oh, that high. <laughs>
100%. Your EKG knowledge is better than my Portuguese. I guarantee it. Guarantee it. Okay, y'all. So. <clears throat> oh, I have just one more piece of information. Oh, sorry, sorry. I didn't see that. It's the exercise stress test. The result was no ECG changes with maximal exertion. And the result was chest pain recurs with maximal exertion and persists after conclusion of study. Okay. All right, y'all. Here's all the data we have. Think about it. And I'll, I'll come to you on this in a few seconds. Nalan, what are you thinking, my friend? Um, oh, uh, so uh, we had, we have actually ST elevation in the V1, V2, V3. So that just made me think something of uh, Brugada syndrome that uh, I believe is a long QD syndrome. I'm not at all sure because it's deep down in my memory somewhere. And mm -hmm. it's essentially a rhythm disorder. So I'm not really sure if, if it can present as a test, uh, test pain at all. I love that. I think you're bringing up the idea that Brugada syndrome, which is a uh, channelopathy, a sodium channelopathy, um, can actually cause ST changes in V1, V2, V3, and there's a very specific pattern to it, which Rafa is a master of, I know, because he's an EKG guru, as he just proved. Um, and, um, you know, the, the thing that is less compatible with Brugada is it tends to cause a su sudden cardiac death or syncope and less so chest pain. Uh, but that, and with this EKG pattern, it should cross your mind for sure. Um, all right, um, Gabrielle, you're thinking about Prince metal. Tell us why. Yeah, I was thinking about Prince metal uh, because of the CT elevation. And I think Rafa mentioned it about the troponins that were normal. And we can see this condition in typically young males that some triggers are, for example, cocaine, tobacco, alcohol, but uh, we don't see those triggers in this patient. Mm -hmm. But the uh, I don't uh, I don't feel very sure about prismeter right now because uh, there are AKG changes uh, when there is maximal physical stress. Uh, I think Rafa mentioned that, uh, and that persists after the end of the test. Um, I learned that prismetal is not correlated very much with physical exercise, so I'm not very sure about it. I love it. I think that um, I think that that vasospasm is always an elegant hypothesis when somebody goes from extreme disease, complete occlusion to not, to complete occlusion to not. And I think that that is a very, very great thought here. Um, so where do we end? I'm just looking at the time. I'm sorry, and we only have a few minutes. So let's just let's just summarize where we're at. Um, we have a patient who had transient onset, who had sudden onset uh, pain. A chest pain that improved spontaneously over an hour is worse with lying back, who has ST elevations in V1 and V2, and um, who, has an, who has a negative stress test for coronary artery disease. And um, it's really hard to put that together, I think. Um, I think it's hard to invoke PE or aortic dissection or tamponade or takotsubo because most patients will not have spontaneous resolution of their pain. And that's a big clue that there's something really bad happening and then there's spontaneous resolution of that bad thing. And I don't think an aortic dissection or a pulmonary embolism or a pneumothorax can fix themselves. So in many other ways, what the question before us is what can be a transient self-resolving cause of life-threatening chest pain. And uh, I think that's where Gabrielle is really making a very astute point that vasospasm may be at play here. The vasospasm of what is the tricky part? Is it vasospasm of the coronary or is it vasospasm of the esophagus? Hard to know. But um, I find myself more and more comfortable with this notion that this is happening, but where is hard? And I cannot wait to learn Maybe we can pause for um, 
uh, 15 seconds or so before Rafa tells us the answer to see if anybody else has, um, has any other oh, thoughts. I can show one more imaging. Which... Yeah, yeah, please, yeah, Rafa, go for it. Do, do you know which one is that? Um, what that imaging? I'm going to show, I think either Echo or CT is my best. Is my best. Okay, you are right. It's a CT. Uh, oh, very hard to see, my friend. What about now? Uh, no, I can see no pneumo. I can't tell if there's a dissection flap or not. Let me show you another image then. <laughs> yeah, Emery, it's only an egg. What else could it be? <laughs> hey, I'm barking. I really can't tell. You're going to have to be, you want to be a cardiologist and you're going to have to be a radiologist now, my friend. What does it show? It shows a flap in the ER. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. All right, Emery was spot on. Her instincts were aortic dissection, aortic dissection, and here we are with one. Rafa, teach us, please. So so the, uh, the CT showed a type one type A aortic dissection originating the ascending aorta and extending through the entire course of the abdominal aorta into the iliac arteries. And despite of the extent of dissection, all major arteries appeared uh, patent and in communication with the two aortic lumen. Emerge, emergent surgical repair was successful and he was charged home in good condition one week later. And when it comes to the um, clinical presentation, uh, the chest pain of acute aortic dissection need not have the ripping or tearing quality of the classic unions script. Pain with features of angina and or pericarditis can also be seen. Uh, however, the abrupt onset of symptoms such that patients often recall the exact time or activity at the moment can be characteristic. And also there's this spell that although pulse deficits, blood pressure asymmetry, and immediate sternal hardening of the chest X-ray are classic features of aortic dissection, a majority of cases do not have all those features and a significant subset have none. The negative predictive value of the absence of these signs, therefore, is heavily dependent on the clinician's initial suspicion for the diagnosis. Amazing teaching, but only only one problem, my friend. Your dog has triggered my dog to go crazy now. <laughs> so I will say no more and, and pass the mic to Gerline to do some teaching. Look at that transcontinental barking. <laughs> Thanks, Rafa, for that interesting case. So when we started off, we were looking at um, the chief concern of chest pain. So when we're thinking about chest pain, different ways to approach it include an anatomic approach. So thinking of things like musculoskeletal causes like costochondritis, or if there was a trauma or a fall or a rib fracture that could be causing the pain. And then other things and other superficial structures to think about include skin, things like zoster or um, the nervous system, the nerves being irritated in that area. And then when we're thinking about more internal causes, thinking about cardiac causes, pulmonary causes, esophagus, as well as mediastinal structures, and then also thinking about referred pain. As we know that sometimes cardiac conditions can present with abdominal pain and epigastric pain, the same thing. Some of the abdominal pathologies can present with referred chest pain. So those are also important to keep in mind. And then when we're approaching chest pain in a patient, it's really important to prioritize the life-threatening and emergent causes. And one way to remember that is the four plus two plus two. So that's the four cardiac things, including aortic dissection, ACS, tamponade and Takatsugu's cardiomyopathy. And then the two pulmonary causes include pneumothorax and pulmonary embolism. And then two esophageal causes include esophageal rupture or impaction. And when we're approaching chest pain, it's important to characterize the pain and get a good history in terms of what risk factors the patient has in terms of past medical history, but also precipitating causes. But as Rafa mentioned, sometimes those classic symptoms that we associate with diseases, such as aortic dissection, might not always be the presenting symptom. So it's important to take how the patient's describing it, but kind of map that onto the presentation in terms of the time course. So in this case, the acute nature of the pain was really important in guiding us and keeping aortic dissection in mind. And then when we're approaching chest pain overall, things to always EKG troponin are obviously tests that we always get. And if those are not diagnostic of an acute coronary syndrome, then it's important to get a CT test and not delay that diagnosis because the CT test can help us diagnose aortic dissection as well as the 
um, pulmonary embolism and some of those other um, really life threatening causes. And then in this case, we were also considering pericarditis because of the nature of the pain, since it was positional pain that usually gets worse by lying down flat or is pleuritic in nature, or which mean, basically means it gets worse with a deep breath kind of points towards pericarditis. And then when we're in this case, the patient's physical exam was pretty normal. So that's important to keep in mind that certain causes of chest pain might present with a normal physical exam, but certain things such as tamponade or pneumothorax, you can have clear evidence on physical exam. And then for aortic dissection as well, you usually think about the unequal blood pressures in the arms, but that is not necessarily present in all patients. And then some other uh, illness groups we talked about were SCAD, so spontaneous coronary artery dissection. So this is more common in female patients and predisposing, predisposing conditions include fibromuscular dysplasia, other connective tissue disorders like Marfan's, as well as pregnancy in the postpartum state. But even though that's more common, SCAD can still occur in male patients. And then in this case, the acuity of the event, the sudden event, the sudden onset points us, as Robbie mentioned, thinking about three different things. Did something tear? Was it a blood vessel like the aorta or a bleb leading to pneumothorax? Or is it a blockage like a plaque rupture leading to an acute coronary syndrome? Or is it an electric cause in terms of an arrhythmia? And then the other thing we talked about was Brugada syndrome. So this is because of a mutation in the cardiac sodium channel. And there's three different types of Brugada. And type one presents with greater than two millimeter ST segment elevation and leads V1 to V3. And the morphology of the ST segment elevation is usually described as puffed. And then for type two, it's more of like a saddleback shape. And then type three, I think can be either, um, either of those type one or type two morphologies. But usually that presents with more syncope and other clues would be a family history of sudden cardiac death. And then another entity we talked about the illness group for was transmittal angina, which is usually episodic in nature and risk factors include smoking and the underlying pathophysiology is vasospasm of the coronary arteries. So thanks everyone for joining. And I learned a lot from this, a lot of reflecting okay. on chest pain. Can we confidently say that Gurleen is ready to be a cardiology intern on Monday? Good luck, Gurleen. That was absolutely masterful. Thank you. Really well done. And thank you all to everybody who participated today. It was an absolute delight. I also am excited to see that Kushal is going to be presenting a case next Saturday. So you don't want to miss it. You really, really don't. All right. See you all then. Bye.